We're jumping into 1 Peter chapter 4 today, and I've called this section, We Are Armed. Now please take some time to read through the section, um, pray and ask God to open your eyes to understand this truth. Pray that God would not only help you to understand it, but that this, this truth would actually transform your life so that you'd be able to live it out and teach it well to others. And as always, just take some time to note interesting ideas, things that you perhaps don't understand, repetition that you see, or key words that Peter uses. And I'm going to highlight some of what I've seen. The section starts with the word therefore. And whenever you see the word therefore, you need to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? And the word therefore always points us back. And in this case, it's pointing us um, to what we just saw in chapter 3, where chapter 3 verse 18, we're told that Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. And with that idea of Christ suffering for us, Peter then says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the, the same attitude. Um, so Peter's still picking up on this idea of suffering, uh, which has been a key idea in 1 Peter. The fact that we are living here as aliens and strangers in this world. This is not our home. And so we should expect to face suffering as we live God's way here. The section starts and ends with a focus on our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it is his suffering in his body that we are he told here to arm ourselves with. Arm yourselves with the same attitude of our Lord Jesus. And Peter is going to flesh out in this section what that actually looks like. Now, in letters like this, uh, both Peter's letters and Paul's letters, it's often useful to look out for what we call imperatives. Imperatives are um, verbs that are commands. And this is the first big imperative in this section, arm yourselves. It's a command. Uh, we are to arm ourselves as suffering servants, just like our Lord Jesus was a suffering servant. Just to note down the other imperatives that we see in this section, um, we see them only in the second half, therefore be alert, it's imperative, sober-minded, it's an imperative. And under those imperatives, Peter fleshes out what this life armed with the attitude of Christ looks like, a life that is alert and sober-minded. Um, and that's, that's what Peter's going to focus in on in this section. And Peter says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, um, and then he says, whoever suffers in the body, it's the same word used throughout this section. Peter is, is showing that in this earthly life, this bodily life, we are going to suffer until that day when we are in the new creation with our resurrection bodies, when suffering will be a thing of the past. But right now, we will face suffering. And Peter's got this interesting statement here at the end of verse uh, 1 where he says that he is done with sin. And we need to just get our heads around what that means it doesn't mean that the Christian is uh, perfect and no longer sins. But just as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, that when Christ died, uh, he took our place and we died to sin. The idea here is that sin no longer masters us. Sin is still something we will struggle with until Jesus returns, but it's no longer our master. So we don't live now for our evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. And Peter then spells out what these evil human desires look like in verses 3 and 4. And all of these things, we don't need to use our imagination uh, to, to know what Peter is talking about. Because the things that were evil human desires in his day are the same as what we see in our day. Debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry, uh, reckless and wild living. We see all of these things at play in our world still today. And Peter is saying all of these things are 
part of the old way of living, living for the evil human desires. He's saying, don't live that way. That is not what it looks like to arm yourselves with the attitude of Christ. That is not what it means to be alert and sober-minded. It's, it's the opposite. But if we do live this way, it's going to mean suffering. Uh, we see here, Peter says that they will heap abuse on you. That is suffering. Uh, they, they, they'll be surprised. The lives we live make absolutely no sense to the watching world. But Peter goes on to say, but, but they will give an account. So the end is coming uh, to him who is, is ready to judge. So the way we live, we need to be mindful that Jesus is coming to judge the living and the dead. And so we don't want to live for our even evil human desires. We want to live for the will of God, just as Jesus modeled to us in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. And as we live according to God's will, rather than living for our own evil human desires, we will face suffering. But we know that Jesus is coming. He's coming to judge the living and the dead. Those who live this way will not stand. But Peter then, he's speaking in verse 5 about those who are living according to evil desires. But in verse 6, he's speaking about those who live according to God's will and then die while living according to God's will. It says they might be judged according to human standards with regard to the body, but they will live. They live according to God with regard to the spirit. You see, the end of this life is not the end. Uh, we will live for all eternity with God. And so that is the good news of the gospel that was preached. Now, these people who, who just live their own way, they might say, well, what's the point? You die anyway. And Peter wants his readers to know that it is worth living according to God's will because death is not the end. We live with regard to the Spirit, with God for all eternity. So we want to be those who live according to the will of God. Peter's going to flesh this out further. Those who live according to God's will are those who are faithful stewards of God's grace. Um, they are the ones who speak the very words of God. They serve with the strength God provides. So doing God's will living according to God, a faithful stewards of God's grace, speaking God's words, serving with God's strength. That's the type of people that we want to be, and that is what it means to be those who are armed with the attitude of Christ. Peter then transitions in verse 7, say, the end of all things is near. He's already said that he's ready to judge. The Lord Jesus is coming to judge. And here he says it's near, now, it's near in the sense that it is the next big thing. Jesus' return in the God's cosmic time frame is the next big thing. Um, all the other events of uh, God's salvation plan, Jesus coming and living and dying and rising again and ascending into glory, that's all happened. The next big thing that is near is the return of Jesus. Now that's near, not in our sense of time, but in God's sense of time. We need to trust God that it is the next big thing. And so while we wait, we've got another therefore. And the therefore is because we know that the end is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind. So stay focused. Uh, be sober minded. Live a life that is ready. Uh, Jesus told us to do the same. Um, told us to stay awake. And then Peter says, so that you may pray. We are to be a people who are prayerfully dependent. Now, if you look at Mark 14, uh, this very Peter who wrote this letter had been with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus said to Peter, James and John, be alert and sober minded. The end of Jesus life was near. And Peter in that situation failed. But the Lord Jesus modeled what it looks like to be alert and sober-minded. Jesus armed himself with an attitude of prayer. 
And Peter now realized that he needs to arm himself with that attitude. We, as Jesus followers, need to arm ourselves with this attitude of prayerful dependence of, on God. So this is one of the things that it means to be armed with Christ's attitude. And then the next few verses have a whole lot of each other language. So we've got above all, love each other. Then we've got show hospitality to one another. And then serve others. So this is what it means for us to clothe ourselves with Christ's attitude. We love each other deeply with a love that covers over a multitude of sins. So what does that mean? Well, we need to have a love that, that lets wrongs done within, all of this is within the Christian community and sins done to each other in the Christian community. We mustn't let those sins grow to their fullest and ugliest expression. We need to have a willingness and an ability to love each other in a way that that lets go of sin, that forgives sins done to each other and forgets about them, doesn't dig them up. And we do this because we're clothing ourselves with the attitude of Christ who loved us in an ultimate sense with a love that covered over our sins by saving us, forgiving us. That needs to be something that we model to each other. We don't hold on to sins. Uh, our love for each other covers over those sins. So we need to be a prayerful people. We need to be a loving people. And then Peter goes on to speak about hospitality. That's one expression of love. Opening our homes and our lives to others without grumbling. We should be expressing our love as the world then can see us loving each other because we're together a lot. Then Peter says, each of you should use whatever gifts you've received to serve others. So prayer, love, and service are what it looks like for us to have the same attitude of Christ. And the service might be in speaking gifts. And if you're speaking, if you are speaking God's truth, you need to be mindful of the fact that you're speaking the very words of God. It's a massive thing to be speaking the gospel to others. And all of us will have that opportunity, obviously, as preachers of the gospel. Um, we will have the biggest role in doing that. But all Christians should be those who are mindful that when you're speaking the truth of God, you're speaking the very words of God. And then if anyone serves, they should serve with God's strength. So we see Peter speaks about serving others as stewards of God's grace. And if we serve, we do it in God's strength, not in our own. And then Peter gives us a reason statement here. So that we live this way, arming ourselves with Christ's attitude, remembering that the end is coming. We live this way, praying, loving, serving, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. We want God to be glorified through us. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. So we are living lives for the praise and the glory of of our Lord Jesus. Peter has said in chapter 2, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That's why we are to arm ourselves with Christ's attitude because that's what we want. We want God to be glorified through us. And God is greatly glorified as others are drawn in and they will be drawn to us as we love each other deeply, as we serve each other wholeheartedly as stewards of God's grace. All of this is what it means for us to be a people who are armed with Christ's attitude, seeking to bring glory to him. So as you dig into this further, think practically about what this might look like in the life of those who you're teaching. And let's be praying that God would be greatly glorified through us. Oh, God bless as you dig in further.